When I look back through history and consider all the sacrifices in every war, and I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves, I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families serving their country, I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in, that each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service, what we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier, one sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform, one Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom one airman who knew the cost and went anyway, one man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many, and the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. Welcome, everybody. Hey, I'm Pastor Ben, and I want to take a moment before we jump into the message and everything. I want to take a second. I want to pray and just pray for the families and honor those that have given the greatest sacrifice. Can we do that together? Will you bow your heads? Father, I thank you for uh, all of the families, giving them strength. In this season, Lord, in this moment, Father, as there's somebody missing at their table that has given the greatest sacrifice, Lord. So I thank you, Father, uh, that, that you're encouraging them. You're meeting them right now, Holy Spirit, with such overwhelming comfort over this weekend. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen and amen. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm Pastor Ben, and I'm our youth and young adult pastor. And before we jump into the word today, I do want to take a moment, and I want to honor you, church. I also want to honor Pastor John and Michelle Nuzo. You know, we have incredible leaders who are uh, passionate about developing young leaders like myself all across our church and all of our campuses. Come on, campuses, make some noise. And so it's just incredible all across. But, but not only are they passionate about it, so are you. And so I want to honor you and thank you because just like myself, you've come alongside me and helped me step into who God has called me to be. So go ahead and give yourself a round of applause, a good pat on the shoulder or something. It's just awesome. Thank you, church. So today we're going to be talking about God's vision for your life. God has vision for you personally. And, and, and we're, we're going to unpack this because I believe that God wants to reveal to your heart the truth that he has. God wants you to have vision. God wants you to have vision for your life and for your family and for our church. God does have vision, amen? In fact, the Bible says that where there's no vision... People perish. God's plan is not for you to perish. God has a plan for you to prosper. And Jesus came so that you could have life and life abundantly. And so people without vision, they're like driving a car without a destination. Like could you just imagine right now if you got in your car from all the campuses, you just start driving down the road. Where are we going? I don't know. It's Memorial Day weekend. You know what I'm saying? And so, and you're just going two, three hours later, all of a sudden you find yourself on the side of the road. You're out of gas. You're broke, busted up, like calling somebody, right? Because, because you ran out of gas. But listen, God, God has a destination planned for you, one that you won't run out of gas. In fact, one that you're fueled on the way there, that you're filled on the way there. Amen? And so I, I want us to open up our Bibles today as we jump into the Word of God. We're going to go to Matthew 28, 16. Matthew 28, 16. And I'll encourage you today, church, to take notes. Note takers are history makers. I really believe this with everything in me that you and I will never graduate from being a student of the word of God. We will never graduate from being a steward with the word of God. We've got to get God's word in us inside the well of our hearts so that in due time it comes up and out of you. So I just encourage you to write down what God reveals to you today because we're reading out of Matthew 28:16. So I'll give you a quick context for where we're going, what's happening. This is Jesus speaking. In fact, in your Bibles right now, it's red letters, and, and he had just died for the sins of the world. 
He just died for you and I, and nobody took his life. He laid down his life, gave it for you and I so that we could have everlasting life, so that we could be free and we could be with him for all eternity. Now, right before Jesus ascended to heaven, right before he got on the escalator and rode all the way up to be seated at the right hand of the Father where he is now, he gave the great commission, mobilizing the disciples, mobilizing you and I to go and do the work of the ministry, giving us all vision, giving us all purpose right now. And this is what Jesus said. This is the great commission. If you're with me, say yeah. All right, he said, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God didn't just call the disciples to go out to all nation, nations. God has called you and I. See, we're talking about that today. We're talking about the vision that God has given us. In fact, if you're taking notes, and I hope that you are, you could write down the title of today's message. It's called Vision for Your Future. Vision for Your Future. I believe that today God wants to bring vision to your life. I believe that God wants to reawaken dreams that maybe have, have slipped away or you've forgotten about. I believe that ideas that God's whispered to you, he's going to reawaken those today. And he's going to empower his children to walk in all that he has for them. Amen? Can we bow our heads? Can we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Father, we acknowledge you right now in all of our ways. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to do a great work in today's service. And you'll bring revelation to the word as we get into it. So, Father, we yield to you. We submit to you everything that comes out of my mouth that's from me. Let it fall to the ground and produce nothing. But everything from you, Lord, let it take root in our heart. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. So real quick, at all of our campuses... By a show of hands, let me see if you're one that you like to just have a little bit of fun. Maybe, maybe you feel like you're the life of the party, you're the, you're the jokester. Maybe you're like me and you're like the prankster. Ah, yeah, that's me. And so I, I remember my 12th grade year getting ready to graduate high school. So we were in the beginning of May. And so I worked at a, at, at a lawn and garden store called Super Kmart, the blue light special. I'll let you, boy. And so I was about 8.30 at night. We're getting ready to wrap up and, and close down. So I'm going up and down all the aisles and I'm checking, making sure that all of the product is stocked. It's brought to the end and the end caps are, are fully loaded. And lo and behold, what I see off into the distance, I see this white bottle that's on its side. And, it, and there's, there's this puddle all around. So I'm like, oh man, it's, this is it. This is the end. And, and so I come walking up and as I get closer, there's this smell. As I get closer, there's this stench. It's the most horrific thing ever. In fact, as I got so close, it was deer repellent that had fallen off the shelf. Now, if you've got a green thumb, you already know. For those of you that might not, let me help you out here. It would be equivalent to if you're a mom or a dad and you have children and you forgot about the diaper genie. And those things have been baking for quite a while. And, and so, you know, you go, you tie up that bag, and you're walking the throat away, and it falls, and it breaks, and it's like, oh, it's just bad, okay? It's a bad moment. So I'm cleaning this thing up, and something comes up in me. I got to tell you, maybe this was just a God idea. It's like, it's too good, right? So I get this idea. I'm like, you know, I haven't come up with my prank yet. And, and so I grab a bottle. I go right to the cashier. As I'm going through the line, I get that old sour spray, you know, the k -k 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 I don't even know where it is these days. We don't see it. But I bought one of those bottles, and I, I buy a 20-ounce bottle of Pepsi. I go through the line, pay for it all. I'm outside in the parking lot because now i got a big day ahead of me. i got to get ready. And so I empty out the sour spray, and I pour all the deer repellent into it. Then I, then I empty out the 20-ounce the bottle of Pepsi, and I put the rest of it in it. And I'm getting ready in the parking lot. I'm practicing because there's a law. It's called the law of drafting. Well, let me help you. And so when you walk really quickly and you stop, all of a sudden the wind catches up on you. And so, listen, I might not be a smart man, Jenny, but, but I know one plus one equals two. got to figure some things out. So I practice in the parking lot. I'm just walking it. 
stop but keep walking, right? Because this could end poorly. Because here's the deal. People remember the beginning and the end. And so I know my graduating year, they're going to remember me. I'm going to land somewhere inside the yearbook as the pooper trader. This could be terrible, okay? And so, so I got to set this up, right? And so I practice. I go home. My mom, she's like, man, you're a little chipper tonight. I said, yes, I am. I got a big day ahead of me. So I got to go to bed. You must have a test. You could say something like that biggest test of my whole entire career and so I go to sleep I wake up the next morning I'm on my way to school my heart's racing hands are sweaty mom's spaghetti and so I make it to school I go through the whole entire day at the very end of the day I got two periods left right before the bell rings I raise my hand I gotta go I can't go to the bathroom. They say, well, you know, you're gonna, the bell's going to ring. You're going to have time. I don't have time for what's about to happen. Okay, you can go. And they, they let me out, and so I start. Your boy starts walking through the hall. I go all the way down to the corner. Everything is gone perfectly planned. It's amazing. Couldn't it be better? I make it to the corner, and then I take the Pepsi bottle, I undo the lid, and I set it right at the corner. Now, if you've got children, you know that the keep your hands to yourself never works, right? Keep your hands inside the buggy at all times. That ain't happening. So you just can't contain yourself. If you're in the school system, you know that when you see a bottle, somebody's got to kick it, okay? So I got that thing right at the corner. The bell rings. It was like stepping on an anthill. They just come out of the woodwork. They're coming through the doors. Everybody's coming out. As they come rushing out, so many kids, they start gagging. (gasps) I can't breathe. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. There's this new girl. She's in the corner. She's crying. The rapture's coming. Oh, my God. Like, it's just horrific, right? Teachers come out. They're like, somebody go check the commode. It must be overflowing. This is so bad. It was horrific. And then there's this kid. He sees the bottle. I'm watching him. Looking at him, I, I, saw the, I saw the look in his eyes. He comes up to it, he locks the leg, and he lets it rip. Boom. Kicks that thing. And it goes all the way up him. And immediately, I'm filled with so much joy. <laughs> I'm like, boom. Got him. Because now I have the scapegoat. Now I'm free. He's the pooper trader. He's going down in history. And, and you're probably like, Ben, that's pretty twisted, man. And you, you call yourself a pastor. Yes, I do. Yes, I do, and I got him good. And, and so if anything, I did him a lot of good. I put him through counseling over the years. It's okay, all right? And, and, and so I finish off the job. I go down to my teacher's favorite classroom. We didn't have air conditioning. So he had a box fan that was pulling all the cold air right from the hall into his classroom. And I just sat, sat there and let the rest of the spray bottle go. Needless to say, he didn't have class the rest of the day. It was awesome. Call me the bandit, you know, because I went down in history. I was free. Oh, so much fun. I remember my school years. I remember being so impacted in high school and and having such a passion for people. And I'll tell you why. When I was in eighth grade, I was walking through the schools. I graduated from Burgestown High School. Basically, it was a single-way school, small. Graduated with 93 students, so not a lot. We knew everybody. And I remember being in eighth grade and going to my locker one in between, in between the periods, and I was putting in my coat, and, and I remember getting bumped, and I'm just like, you, you want to fight? Like, you know, those moments that come up in you, and, and I'm there putting in my coat, and I, I heard in my heart, in my gut, I, I heard, they're going to die and go to hell. And I remember looking around going, what? Who said that? I knew that, but I didn't, he, I just knew, I had this knowing, and There was nobody that said it, and so I I go back, and I I start putting in my coat again, and and at this time, I I heard the Lord so clearly in my heart. I heard him speak to me, and there are many students that are going to die, and you're bumping shoulders with them every single day. They're going to die and go to hell, and something happened in my heart. I, I felt the compassion of the Father. I felt the love for his people. I'll never forget God speaking to my heart and that, that burning inside of me. In fact, it's why I'm a youth pastor to this day. It's why I love this next generation is what God put in my heart. I'll never forget him speaking so clearly. My whole high school career changed in that moment, and I had a passion for his people. But when I was young, I didn't have a thriving church like you and I do. 
I didn't have a thriving youth ministry like you and I do. I didn't have small group leaders inside the youth ministry to help me process the things that God was putting in my heart and help me make sense of some of the things he was birthing in me. To help me with the vision for my life. To help me with vision for my church. Because you know the church is an us thing. It's you and I. We, we don't come to a church. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. I want to give you three thoughts today. Three thoughts to help you have vision for your life right now in the season that you're in. Three things that I believe that God will help you understand what his plan is right now for you. These are three easy practical steps, if you will, that I believe God's just going to line you right up like a chiropractor. If you're taking notes, you could go ahead and write down number one today. Acknowledge that God is the source of vision and purpose. We can't create vision on our own. Vision ultimately comes from God. I mean, I could. I could dream up all my plans, all my amazing things that I want to do. I could work hard. This is America. I could get the dream that I want. I could land it. And here's the deal. When I land it, I will have to sustain it. I'll have to maintain it without God on my own strength, on my own ability. But if I do it with God and I co-labor with Christ and he's baked in the planning and I seek him and I have his direction and his approval and his backing, if God is in it, then he'll be with it. So I want to get to my God dream with God in it because then he'll sustain it. I'll have his grace. I'll have his anointing. In fact, right now, what you are watching right here with me is you are watching the physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit on my life. You are watching God's grace and anointing on me with the ability to minister. It's not my own strength. This is God right here. That's what you're watching manifest right here. See, I would rather lean not on my own understanding, but trust the Lord in all of my ways, and he'll make straight my path. Every morning, I wake up in the morning feeling like every morning, all right, that didn't land. Okay, pop culture reference, scratch that. But every morning, I, I wake up and, and I get before the Lord and I process and I, that was funnier than you all. I just want to say, okay, all right, I'm just going to acknowledge it. But I wake up and I say, good morning, Lord. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, and I acknowledge him. I thank you. I'm the one that you love, that you love me. I'm your favorite, that you lead me that you guide me, that you teach me, that you show me what path to take today. I acknowledge him every single day. See, the Bible says that, that many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. Proverbs 29, 18 says that where there's no vision, the people perish. God has a plan for you, one that is for you to prosper, not to perish. God even said in Isaiah 55, verse 8, he said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. In other words, God is not your homeboy. Jesus is not your bro. You and I are not on the same level as God. He is our Lord. He is our master who just so happens to call me friend. What an amazing place to be in. What an amazing spot. And then he continues to say, he says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we're not equal. We are not the same, God and I. We are on way different levels. He's my Lord, he's my master, and we have to acknowledge that God is the source of our vision and purpose. And when we do so, when we seek him, we will find him. In fact, you can write down number two today. Seek the Holy Spirit's guidance in discerning God's vision for your life. God's not hiding. God's not playing Marco Polo this weekend in a pool. That's not, that's not it, Marco Polo. That's not God. He's not hiding as you seek him. You will find him. And there's this ongoing work in the heart of all believers where the Holy Spirit is providing direction. The Holy Spirit is providing clarity and revelation and coaching and he's ministering to you. It's called progressive sanctification. God doesn't convict you of everything day one. You couldn't handle it. You'd collapse. 
You're not perfect. Have you noticed God continues to refine you as you grow, as you go? He's doing that. Church, you and I, we have to spend time in prayer. We have to spend time in the word. And then we have to pause and listen for the still, quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. I, I call it the 20 plus. Take 20 plus every day. Every day. Sit down, take five minutes, put on worship music. Take five minutes and pray. Take five minutes, get in the word of God. And then take five minutes and stop talking and listen. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. In fact, you should, you should listen twice as much as you talk. Listen to what God's saying because he's speaking to you. It's a two-way conversation. I remember when I was growing up through my, my school years and I remember I'd come downstairs. We had this grand staircase. And I'd come down and I'd see my mom every morning sitting in this busted up, dirty, ripped up recliner. I mean, this thing was dirty as sin. Okay, it was terrible. She wanted to throw it away. I, I never knew why, but she would sit there every morning. She would be awake before we were, and she'd be reading her Bible. All the while, the Bible was reading her. It's amazing what God does. And so she's getting into the Word. I mean, these pages were folded. They were ripped. Some were missing. She had the old school Bible tabs, and, and some of those were missing. And, and they were scribbled on. They were highlighted. This thing was so ripped up and so dirty. Maybe you've heard it said that a dirty Bible equals a clean heart. Like, that is this moment, okay? And what I noticed that my mom would do that I absolutely loved, and it got embedded in my heart. My mom would rather walk with the Lord in the morning than trying to find him in the afternoon when everything went sideways. It was just incredible. Parents, I got to tell you right now, if you have children in the room, like zero to five is the foundational years, and then five to ten is the teaching years, and 10 to 17 is your coaching years. You've got to lay the foundation because what you're modeling, they're going to pick up and it's going to take root in their heart. I'm telling you. It's going to change their life. I would watch my mom do this. It has changed my life. In fact, Psalms 25, 4 says, show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. God told Joshua in Joshua 1, 8, he said, let the law of the Lord be on your mouth meditating on it both day and night, that you may consider all that's within it, and then you will be successful, and then you will be prosperous. What about Hebrews 4.12? The word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It separates the bone from the marrow and the joint from the spirit. It exposes us for who we really are. Translation, who God has called you to be. What about Psalms 119.11? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, God. What about about Psalms 119.09. How does a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed according to the word of God. There is something about the infallibility, the indestructibility, living word of God. The grass may wither and the flowers may fade, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. Come on, church. Let's make a great noise for Jesus. God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He'll speak to your heart as you seek him. In fact, in John 16, 13, he says, but when, the, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. Jesus even said in Matthew 6.33, but seek first his kingdom and righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I would encourage you you know, we just ended our, our small group season. I would encourage you, if you don't have a strong devotional time, to call up your, your small group leader that you had and say, hey, what, what's your devotional time look like? What's that look like for you? You know the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. We're to get together and we encourage each other and we help each other. In fact, if, even if you go to our website, I, I did a video on Join the Family on how to have a devotional time and actually how to dive into that and seek God. I would encourage you, seek the Holy Spirit's guidance in discerning God's vision for your life. And as we get ready to close today, this third thing I believe goes in great succession. See, serving brings clarity to the vision that God gives you. Serving brings clarity to the vision that God gives you. You can always tell if a vision is from you or it's from God by who it involves. 
when it's a God vision, it'll always involve impacting people and making great the kingdom. When it's a you vision, it involves you. And Jesus said that they will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. And love is a verb, it requires action. It's easy to talk about loving somebody, but when was the last time you loved somebody? Serving takes our eyes off of us and places them on him. And when we serve others, it helps us to find our purpose in the season that we're in. See, it's so easy for you and I to equate purpose with career. But that's not what happened with the Great Commission. Jesus gave us all a command. What was the command? He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. That is your calling. That is the calling for every believer. See, there's a difference between your calling and your assignment. Calling is general. We all have been called to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as your self. We've all been called to do that. We've all been called to walk out and be the hands and feet of Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And your assignment is your job. Your assignment is the task or the project, and it's temporary. It's what you're doing at the moment. And it's subject to change. They're subject to move. All of our calling is to reach people and to minister to people, not just Pastor Ben, not just Pastor John Nuzo, no. All of us. An assignment, let me give you an example. Maybe you build homes, that's an assignment. Maybe you're a farmer, that's an assignment. Maybe you're a student, that's an assignment. Maybe you're a doctor, that's an assignment. Maybe you're a youth pastor, that's an assignment. And they're subject to change. See, my value doesn't come from my vocation. My value comes from me being a child of God. And when we serve others, it helps us to find the purpose in the season that we're in. Because you'll go through seasons, my friend. At the same time, it'll help you to build community and relationship with like-minded people. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. What about Psalm 68, 6? God sets the lonely in families. You have a family. When you refresh others, you yourself are refreshed and we are better together. We've got to do this thing together. We need one another to help us get where God is calling us to go and, and get where he's taking us. That's why the church is so powerful. It's full of like-minded people who offer support to one another, care for one another, encouragement in their walk with God. You can't get to the wrong places with the right people. Maybe you've heard it said that a bird, birds of a feather flock together, that you'll be a sum makeup of your five closest friends. It's true. Church, we need each other so that we can come together, so we can serve one another and reach out to others in need. Amen? Because we're called to reach people. We're called to love people. I, I believe that all of our campuses and campuses to come, that we will be the most welcoming church. You know what I love about our church? That when you bring somebody here, you don't have to know somebody. You can just say, hey, this is my friend. And you just pull them in. You're just like, hey, what's up? Like your family now. And you just love people. That's you. You're doing that. Why? So that people can be set free. So that people can be loved and it's just incredible. They can join the family. All because you are loving people like Jesus. I remember when I was in my early 20s. I'm older than you think. I remember when I was in my old, or, or early 20s, I came back to the Lord and I started coming to our church here. There was a Saturday night service, our young adult ministry. I rededicated my life to the Lord. It was powerful. And when I gave my, my heart to the Lord, I jumped all in both feet, and I just watched God hit fast forward on my life. It was like he accelerated all of my 20s. and I mean, all up to the 20s. He just, boom, he did his thing, and I started serving God. Fun fact, I'm a drummer. 
you never knew, but now you know, okay? And so, and so I would just, I would worship God, I would play, and I, I just was so on fire. Every Saturday night in our youth ministry here and the young adult ministry, we didn't have a drummer. It was me for two years. It was like, I just, and God was doing such a great work, and in fact, uh, I, be, because of that, we, we grew so connected with everybody that uh, Pastor Larry Betancourt at Champion Life over, over real close to the Cranberry campus, I was serving at his church every other Sunday, and I was coming and just sitting under Pastor John Nuzo. Why? Because the Bible says let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Like I just, I couldn't contain what God had done in my life. I just had to put my hands to something. And and there was this kid that I worked with and and for the sake of the story and for him, we'll call him Little Timmy. And so I worked with Little Timmy and, and when I started coming to church here, I was so excited. I just brought him with me, Little Timmy and I. And we would drive all the way from, from Moon Township. And, and so we would come. We would make the journey about 40 minutes. For one year, I brought him. And when I, when I was working in the corporate world, I worked at Dick's corporate office. I was in a scratch kitchen. And so I was the catering director. And so we had all this whole team of people working. And he was there. And they would make fun of him. I mean, it was horrific, the things that they would do and say, and it just was wild. And so I brought this kid with me, little Timmy, every single Saturday night. And we, our relationship became so strong that, that one time we were on the way home, and I asked him, I said, you know, why do you sound like that? Why do you talk the way that you do? And, and you know, I was just being casual and cool because we, we were close enough. I'm like, why, why do you look like that? And he said, he said you know, Ben, when I was, when I was three years old, so my, my mom and dad, they were making dinner and they put dinner inside the crock pot and they forgot something. We lived real close to a grocery store and so they just ran out. They put us down for nap time and, and they ran out and when they came home, the house was on fire. He said, just as they were coming home, it was, it was such a blaze that the fire department was already rolling up and he said, they, they came in, they rescued me, but my one-year-old sister died in the fire. And I'm listening to him. I'm in the car, I'm driving, I, I can't even see the road because I'm just like, I'm like, my God, this wasn't in the manual, I was a drummer, and he, like, Lord, and I, I'm listening to him and he continues to tell me, he says, you know, I, I never understood my whole life, my dad's just been so angry with me, he said my dad started drinking, I've never known him to not drink, and he said he would abuse me physically, emotionally, he said, over this, over this last year, I gave my heart to the Lord, and this last year, God has just been chiseling away at my heart, and he said, I, I realize over the last few weeks that I can forgive my dad, because my dad's not mad at me. He doesn't know how to navigate that he, he lost his daughter. And I'm listening to him. The hope that was brought to him by a simple action of bringing somebody to church with me. And I remember saying to myself, I said, God, he needs me. He needed me. And you know what God said back to me? You needed him. And for two years, I didn't understand what that meant. I would ask God, Lord, as he continued to just refine my heart, what, do you, what did you mean he needed me for two years? It became so clear to me that when you and I water others, we ourselves are watered. And all the while, while I was investing in him, I happened to be in one of the lowest moments of my life. And I had my eyes off of me and on Jesus and what Jesus had. And that whole time, God was refining my heart. I didn't even know it. He was doing a great work in me. I did need him. God sent him me. He didn't send me to him. Changed his life, it changed my life. God refreshed me. Maybe nobody's ever told you this before. I wanna tell you right now that you're a leader. That you're a leader. God has called you to be a leader. What is, a, what, is, what is leadership? Leadership is simply influence and God wants you to influence others with the good news, with the gospel. Leader. God wants to use you to lead your friends to Christ. Leader, God wants to use you to lead your family to Christ. And I want to ask you today, as a family, as a church, 
I want to ask you if you'd step up and you'd take a seat, the seat that you belong to sit in at the table. Here as a church family and begin serving. Now in the season that you're in, now, right now, God has called you, God has equipped you to lead the generation right now, all around you. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how young you are. What do you, what do you need me to do, Pastor Ben? What do, what do you need? What, what does that look like for me? I'm going to give you two ways right now for you to make an impact. Two ways right now. Number one, come to church and don't come alone. Come to church and don't come alone. It's what we do as a church. We invite people to church with us and we help people have a relationship with him. I have a goal with the Lord. I was telling Alyssa, my wife, I, I, I have a goal. I, I, wanna, I wanna lead 20 people to Jesus outside of the church. 20 people at a gas station, at a grocery store, wherever it is, I wanna I want lead 20 people outside of church to him. But did you know inviting somebody to church is one of the easiest ways that you and I can evangelize? I mean, just imagine, because when you bring somebody new into the family, the whole family goes, oh my God, you're home. Come here. That's the kind of culture we have. That's the kind of environment that we have at our church. It's warm. It's welcoming. And I would encourage you that when you come to church that you expect God to move. Because an expectation is an invitation for God to show up and to show off. And God's got a word for you. God's got a word for the friend that you bring. God is moving. People are dying and they're going to hell. And we are to share the love of Jesus. You will never look into the eyes of somebody that Jesus didn't die for. The next time somebody cuts you off, you will never look into the eyes of somebody that Jesus didn't die for. And then number two, from this day forward, choose to make church a priority. Make church a stronger commitment. Make a commitment to the family. We're better together. You know, one of the ways that we make a stronger commitment is serving in the church. Why? Because it's, it's the family's house. There's some chores to do in the house, right? We're the family. Every believer is called to use their gifts in the church. And this all leads people to Jesus and, and, and to him. And, and I really believe that in order for you and I to get where God is calling us to go, in order for you and I to help all people realize that God loves them unconditionally, that we have to step into these things. Will you join me? Will you step into this and make the commitment to those two things, coming to church and not coming alone, and then committing to making church a priority? It will change your life. In fact, if you say yes, if this is you right now before God, before me, as a bold statement of faith and a commitment right now as a confession, would you raise your hand and say, Ben, I'm in, at all of our campuses. Thank you, thank you. There's hands that are going all up. Thank you, thank you. It's incredible. I believe they're happening at our campuses too. See, Jesus said that we're called for the Great Commission. Don't be okay with people dying and going to hell. There's only two kingdoms. There's only two options. People in these rooms right now at all of our campuses, there's only two options. You will either die and go to heaven or you will die and go to hell. And I wouldn't wish hell on my worst enemy. It's the only, it's, it's the reality. The next time you're on a plane, people are either gonna go to heaven or they're gonna go to hell. The next time you're in a grocery store, that's it. The next time you're in a classroom, that's it. That's all that there is. Don't be okay with it. It's the calling of every believer, every child of God. Be the influence that they need to lead them to Christ. And I believe that right now, there may be a mother that's praying for their son, and God may, may be sending you across somebody's path who has the words and that can relate and understand what somebody's going to to speak the language that they need. Also that they could experience God's unconditional love. I want to pray for you. Can we bow our heads at all of our campuses? Father, I thank you. We acknowledge right now, Lord, that you are the source of vision. You give us purpose. Father, I thank you for strength as we seek you, Holy Spirit, for guidance and discerning your vision for our life in the seasons that we're in. And I thank you, Lord, that as we serve 
people. We're never more like you than when we're serving. So when we serve people, we serve people in the church, we're building relationships, we're building communities. And God, you're giving us clarity for the vision that you have for us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. Maybe today you've come at all of our campuses and you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. You've never invited him into your life. One of the things I love about our church is we will always do an altar call because we're passionate about reaching people. So maybe you've come today. I want to tell you that God loves you. He's obsessed. He's a jealous God. He loves you. So maybe you've come today and you, you've never invited Jesus into your life. You've never made him Lord and Savior of your life. Lord means master. Lord means I, I, I no longer govern my life. You do, Lord. You do, Jesus. Maybe you've never done that before. I want to give everybody here an opportunity at all of our campuses. Jesus said that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through me. It's only through relationship with Jesus. So in other words, it doesn't matter how much good you do, and we're called to do a lot of good. It's your relationship with Jesus. Paul even talked about it in Romans 10, 9 and 10. He said that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus died on the cross and arose again three days later, defeating death, purchasing your sin debt, that you'll be saved. That's what we're going to do here in a moment. So I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads at all campuses. If you'd like to receive Jesus right now to make him your Lord and your master right now, right where you're at, at all campuses, would you slip up your hand right now? Thank you. Thank you. I believe at our campuses, our campus pastors see you as well. As well. Now we're going to pray. And as we do so, we're going to pray as a family. And the Lord's going to come into your life and you are saved. You are heaven bound. Will you repeat after me? Say it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I believe that Jesus, you died on the cross, and you rose from the grave three days later, defeating sin and death. Thank you. I'm a child of God, and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. Come on, all campuses, let's give God a great clap. All of heaven right now is rejoicing, the Bible says. It's an incredible moment.